thanks for coming. I want to begin with the question. Uh, imagine you're a thousand years back in time in medieval Germany or France, let's just say Europe, and think of where you are now and compare that to back then. And what would you say is the difference in the way you see yourself now versus how you would have been using your imagination, let's say, a thousand years ago in medieval Europe? I know it's an abstract question, but there's, there's fundamental differences in the way we've changed over the last few centuries, over the last millennium or so. What are those differences? How do we see the world differently? How do we see ourselves differently? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah? I think we're much freer today. Freedom. Okay. Anything else? We'd be, I'd be seeing myself much more locally, dealing with you know, very, things that were very close at hand instead of globally and, and being aware of all the different things that are happening on, on the global stage. Yeah, that's a big one. Anything else? Yeah? Hierarchic system. Uh, in other words, feud, feud, feudalism was very ordered and hierarchical. Very rigid. Were loose, uh, free spirit. Yes. Any, uh, I saw another hand going up here. Any, yeah. Uh, it's probably more focused, more connected with the seasons, with light and dark. Yeah. With the, with the earth, I guess. That's a good point. Yeah, and more connected to nature and the cycles of nature. Anything else? How do you see yourself differently? I mean, how, what's, you know, we're raised very differently now than people were back then. I mean, in, in all sorts of ways. What's, uh, how does your thinking different? How is your way of being different? Any thoughts about that? We go much faster. Everything is at a faster rate, yeah. Anything else? It may not be as theocentric. Ah, <clears throat> uh, yes. Yes. Um, whether you're a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Christian, it's definitely less theocentric now than it was back then. Any last pointers to here before I go on? Not connected to nature like before. Yeah, not connected to nature. All right. Uh, I'm going to come back to that point in a little bit here because to me, one of the things I'm trying to do here tonight is give a sense of how we've changed and how we are continuing to change. And one of the ways that I like to introduce these talks is with a metaphor, an analogy that I got from William Irwin Thompson, who used the image of a fly crawling across the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which I think is, is an incredibly powerful metaphor. And the idea being, obviously, that the fly cannot see that tableau in front of it, it can't see the myths, it can't see the stories that it's embedded in, you might say. It's too close to it to see it. Now, and that's our predicament in a way. We're too close to the myths, to the stories, to really see it. But now imagine that that fly is crossing over from one of the stories on the Sistine Chapel, if you've ever been there or even seen it in pictures. It's crossing over very slowly from, let's say, the story of Genesis over into another story. It wouldn't even know that it's making a transition in terms of the story that it's part of. And that's kind of where we are right now in terms of we're transitioning between archetypal stories, mythic stories. And there are certain ways of understanding what those stories are, as we're going to talk about here. But first, I, I want to mention uh, the question sometimes comes up, why is it important to know this? It's important to know it because we're shaped by these stories in virtually every aspect of our lives, our lifestyle, our, even our relationships, our way of thinking, um, our careers, our uh, fears, everything. And so by understanding the stories, you start to have some understanding of who you are and who you aren't in terms of how you're being guided and manipulated in ways you may not even know. And it's almost as though there are these tectonic shifts taking place underground that are causing the plates to move and the landscape to change. But you may not see it right away. It's like if you go to India, you see the uh, Himalayas. That didn't come up overnight. That took a very long time. And so the, the mythological landscape changes over a very long period. Uh, but one of the things, the reason I opened up the, with the question I did is that it not only affects 
how you see the world, it not only affects the sort of world you live in, it affects your sense of identity. With every mythological shift, there's a shift, a fundamental shift in how we see ourselves, how we regard ourselves, and our possibilities. Now, what I want to, uh, well, maybe I should say a word first about, you know, what are myths? Um, Carl Jung used to say that myths are the collective dreams and dreams are the private myths which I think is a really good way to put it. Joseph Campbell, who I did study with many years ago, uh, used to say, uh, he had a more tongue-in-cheek way of saying it, which I liked. He said, a myth is somebody else's religion. And it's a little flip, but there's profundity in that. Because in a sense, uh, a mythology is a matrix of beliefs, but like the fish in water doesn't even know what water is because it's so much a part of that water. The matrix of, uh, a matrix of beliefs that we're embedded in are so pervasive that we, we, we recognize it when we see it in somebody else's life or religion, but we don't see it in our own. And it may not even take the form of a religion. That's one of the points I want to try to get to tonight, that mythologies aren't necessarily just religious beliefs. I think that historically that's been the case. It's not so much the case anymore. And... Some people even say that there are no myths. There's not even a, a decrease in the role of religion, in the West anyway, and in the secular East. But some people say that the myths are dying out. There are no more myths, which is not true. There are still myths in different forms. Joseph Campbell used to talk. He wrote a book called Creative Mythology, where he, he spoke about the fact that myths are now appearing through the artists, through the writers, through the filmmakers, through the poets, in a way that um, are, are almost seems to be replacing the old storytellers. And on top of that, you've got the myths in terms of the what I call the implicit myths, the myths that you don't see. Political movements are myths, whether they realize it or not. Uh, technological changes have a mythic undertone. In a sense, everything is mythological, in the sense that everything has an archetypal basis to it whether it's science or politics or the arts or whatever it might be. Now, Joseph Campbell uh, also had an interesting way of fielding the question, whenever anyone would ask him, what are the myths of the future? What are the mythologies of tomorrow? And he used to say that we can no more know what the myths of tomorrow are than we can know what we're going to dream tonight, which I don't agree with at all. And the reason I don't agree with that is that you can, if you know how to read the signs, you see what the myths are. An analogy for that is summer comes along and then suddenly the colors start to change. And you, if you know the nature of the cycles, if you know the nature of the seasons, you know that fall is coming and you understand what fall is. And then when the leaves start falling from the trees and the, it starts getting cold and the snow comes out, the first snowflake comes on the ground, you know that winter is coming on. It's the same thing with mythological shifts. There are the signs and the symbols that start appearing. Now we have an advantage as an astrologer. We have, astrologers have a bit of an advantage in that we can chart what those larger mythological changes are. So for instance, uh, we talk a lot in the astrological field uh, about the great ages, the age of Pisces, the age of Aquarius, the age of Aries, and so on. And each age that comes by produces a major shift in our identity, a shift in the way we look at the world, the shift in the things that we're curious about. But it's so all-pervasive, like that water that the fish swims in, that we usually don't see it at the time. It's after the age has passed that we see, oh yeah, that's right. So for instance, we've, um, well, I should probably say a word about, excuse me, the technological astronomical aspect of it. The ages run roughly 2,100 years long, each one. That's a rounded off figure. And the whole round of ages, the great year, is roughly 2,600 years. There's some variance in there because of astronomical factors. But starting roughly around the time of Christ, we have been in the age of Pisces, which is uh, the 12th sign of the zodiac. And that's where the vernal point, the, the wobble of the earth, causes the, uh, 
uh, the Earth to be pointed towards a, um, um, a certain constellation. And it's been moving through the constellation of Pisces roughly for 2,000 years. And it's slowly moving backwards through the zodiac and then in a different direction than the sun moves. It's going backwards into Aquarius. And there is varying dates on that. Some people say it's 500 years off. Some people say it's 500 years ago. I think it's like saying, when does the sun come up at dawn? Is it when the light first starts appearing over the horizon? Is it when the, you see the first little glimmer of the sun's orb? Is it when the sun is already up? It, it comes in waves. It's like the tide. Uh, when, what, if you have a watch and you look at the tide, what moment does it come in? It doesn't come in at a moment. It comes in in waves. It's the same thing with an age. And it's determined by things like planetary cycles. We're in one of those waves right now with Uranus squaring Pluto. You know, major outer planet aspects seem to usher in the ages. But the, let's say a little bit about the age of Pisces. Um, the age of Pisces, it's a water sign. And so that one of the things that that tells us is it's, a, it's an age of emotionality. Every age has emotionality, of course, but it's an age that's predominantly one of Piscean water, Piscean emotionality, which is to say it's an age of, on the good side, because every age has its good and its bad. The Piscean age has a lot to do with compassion on the positive side. It has a lot to do with belief. The signs Sagittarius and Pisces are, are ruled by Jupiter and Neptune, and that's ideological, it's belief, it's dogma. So it's an age of religion, it's an age of global religion. The last two signs of the zodiac are the most cosmic, the most expansive signs of the zodiac. So that, is, that means this has been an age that has seen global uh, religious belief systems like Buddhism, Christianity, Islam. Uh, it's also an age of great uh, sea voyages, by the way, um, which I think there's sometimes literal expressions of these ages. Um, it's also the predominant symbol, you might say, of the Piscean Age is a man on a cross. The crucifixion. And I'm not going to even try, even though I have an art background, it, well, maybe I'll do that. That's, you know, well, um, maybe sacrilegious, I guess, to draw it like that. But uh, the idea of a man hanging from a cross, a torture symbol, now, you can look at that in a good way or a bad way in terms of what it says about the mythologies we've just come out of for the last 2,000 years. We're still, we still have one foot in that age. But the positive side of that is selflessness. It's like a giving up of the ego. It's that sense of, of um, compassion. It's, it's a, a positive expression of... Uh, that Piscean energy would be St. Francis of Assisi, for example, that sense of giving oneself over. Um, it's also the age of chivalry, the age of, 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 again, of sacrifice. It's an age of conscience because it's a water sign, that's a feminine sign. That means it's an internalized sign. The age of Pisces was an age when there was really an awakening of conscience. If you look at the old classical text, like from the ancient Greeks, you don't really see a sense of sin in the way we understand it. You don't see a sense of conscience in the way we understand it. It's a more mechanical thing. There was something that happened in the age of Pisces of an interiority, a sense of reflection of conscience. The bad side of that is the Piscean age has been one of guilt. It's been one where there has been almost a virtue made, excuse me, a virtue made out of, of, of suffering, of self-denial. You know, it's the opposite sign is Virgo, and so the Virgo <coughs> Pisces axis has to do with service, but it also has to do with self-denial. It's, it's an internal reflection energy. It's, uh, and it's also the age of Pisces. There's that sense of not only being persecuted, but persecuting others. You see with both Pisces, and every sign has its good and its bad, and the so-called bad of Pisces, Sagittarius, is that dogmatic persecution quality of trying to convert other people to one's belief system. It's not uh, like Aquarius, which is more kind of eclectic and ecumenical in its nature. Uh, and the other thing, too, about the Piscean age, Pisces is a sign that, how do I say this nicely? 
it's, it, it can be a sign like Neptune having to do with addiction. Now, that de doesn't have to be substance. It can be addiction in the sense of someone's going to come and save me. I need an external savior. And I don't want to step in on any religious toes here, but uh, the negative side of Pisces is that sense of I can't do it myself. I need someone from the outside to come in and take over and save me. That's changing quite rapidly. So now we're kind of, I'm, that's kind of a Cliff Notes version of the Piscean Age, the last 2,000 years. I'm, oh, I, one other thing I want to point out is that the Piscean Age, I think, will be remembered for millennia to come as an age of the most extraordinary art and music. It's an age when you think of, let's say, Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and the uh, composers that preceded them, like Palestrina and all that. And in, in terms of art, I don't think we're ever going to see another Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci, uh, artists like that. So that Piscean energy and its creative side has given us extraordinary artwork and music and poetry. And also in terms of you, if you go into the Buddhist tradition, the last 2,000 years have been remarkable in terms of the figures that have come out of Buddhism like Dogen. And uh, Buddhism has evolved over the last 2,000 years as well. So this has been an extraordinary age in some ways. It's been a horrible age in others. Like I sometimes say, it's the same age that gave us St. Francis of Assisi, gave us Torquemada, who ran the Inquisition, and Pat Robertson, <laughs> you know, and, and Jerry Falwell. You, know, I, I, it, you, you get highs and lows. It's very simplistic and black and white to think of an age as being all good or all bad. You always get, with every age, incredible complexities with it. So now we're moving into the age of Aquarius. We've already started, it started centuries ago in my opinion, it, you can see it as far back with the humanism of Shakespeare, and you really see it pick up a head of steam around the discovery of Uranus, which was 1781, so in the, the mid-1700s up through around 1800, you see this burst of activity that looks very Aquarian in a lot of ways, in every field virtually. But it's an air sign. That's very different from water. We're moving from a, a water sign into an air sign. What is air? Christine, what does air represent in terms of the psychological quality? The mind, the mind rationality, intellectuality. It's very different from water. You know, water is more like a faith. It's more like belief. Whereas air is more of a questioning, rational sort of energy. It relates to science. It relates to telecommunications. It relates to the information superhighway. Information overload sometimes with it. And it also, by the way, in the same way that the Piscean Age had a lot to do with uh, sea voyages, the Aquarian Age, you're seeing a lot of air travel. You're seeing a lot. And the aviation really began with the uh, discovery of Uranus. Uh, with the Montgolfier uh, balloon out of France in 1783, which is two years after the discovery of Uranus. And now we have space travel. These are all Aquarian sort of symbols. And the shift from the water age to the air age is showing up in our culture in, in the most interesting ways. Like, for example, in the movie The Matrix, Neo's awakening is shown. He comes out of this watery womb into an air-breathing realm. If you saw the movie The Truman Show, which is a remarkable film, really, if you haven't seen it, look at it. It's quite metaphoric. Uh, I could talk at length about that. But uh, in the end of the movie, he walks he walks on water and walks through the sky. It's, again, water into air. Uh, you look at movies like The Sound of Music, which came out up for quite a few years. That was the biggest blockbuster in the, in the world in terms of uh, box office sales. The movie is about this nun, or this novice, that eventually, I'm not giving away anything here, if everybody here has seen it, <laughs> but the movie is about this novice who, uh, played by Julie Andrews, who gives up the church life in order to pursue a secular life, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, it was a very, it's a shift from Pisces, the specific monastic Christian life, into the um, Aquarian life, the secular life, the life of personal pleasure, which is certainly not indicative of Pisces Virgo axis. Um, if you ever saw the movie Shock a Lot, it's very similar where Johnny Depp, and it was a Juliette Binoche, I think, 
you know, they represent the Aquarian characters, Aquarius, Leo, and they're into pleasure, they're into freedom, and they've got this very staid Christian community that is kind of resisting them, and it's about the tug of war going on between the two ages in a way. Uh, the movement from slavery to freedom, which happened uh, in the West, we think of it primarily associated with the Aquarian Abraham Lincoln. And uh, that slavery, again, is a Piscean symbol in the same way that, let's say, the oil industry is. Some people think we won't be out of the Piscean age until we get off of oil. There might be some truth to that. But certainly slavery, the abolishment of slavery, is an extraordinary, although we have slaves of a different sort now, unfortunately, but uh, in various ways. But we basically got rid of the old school slavery, shall we say. And uh, I, by the way, and it's interesting that Abraham Lincoln was born the same day as Charles Darwin, and they both have a strong Pisces Aquarius energy in their chart, and they both signal, they both ushered in revolutions. Uh, Abraham Lincoln ushered in the revolution in the United States between from slavery to freedom, and Charles Darwin ushered in the, the transition from Pisces to Aquarius in terms of the transition from uh, the old school way of creation myths and looking at the world to the scientific worldview. And so the two guys born on the same day really had allied sort of destinies, you might say. 9-11, uh, you know, you look at the terrorist uh, and I don't want to get too heavy into this because it's, it's very complicated, but you look at the war between the secular West, or the, yeah, I might, you know, maybe I should say the secular modernity versus uh, the old school sort of uh, religion, whether that's Islam or whether that's fundamentalist in America or around the world. And that is a battle between the Piscean Age and the Aquarian Age. You know, this is manifesting in all sorts of ways. Uh, but it really relates to a, 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 a shift that's taking place inside between rationality and emotionality and trying to find a middle ground there. And that's key. What is, is there a middle ground? Because some people talk about, if, like if you read books on esotericism, on the shifting ages, they talk, for example, about Moses casting out the, col the golden calf as being a symbol from the movement of Taurus age into the Aries age. You know, because he was more or less saying, the occultists believe, he was saying that's, that's of the past, we need to move on to the bull age. And I mean, uh, we're moving on from the bull age to the ram age, and of course the, the, the symbol of the Aries age was the, the ram, and you see Alexander the Great depicted on coins with the ram's ears, and the, the, the Old Testament, there's a lot of ram symbolism. And so there is that element of casting out, but that's just one of four dynamics, I think. The one dynamic is the old resisting the new, like for example, the Roman Empire not liking the new Christians and therefore persecuting them. That's the Aries age resisting the, the Piscean age. The new resisting the old, because the new one may not like the old one. And so for example, um, uh, what would be a good example of that? The new resisting the old would be, for example, Waco, Texas, where the government in 1993, when Uranus conjuncted Neptune, uh, the government came in and wiped out the compound in Waco, the uh, David Koresh compound. I'm not getting into the politics there. I'm just saying the symbolism is that of a secular Aquarian government uh, going against a, a religious compound. And you can make up your own mind about you know, the right or wrong of that. That's not what I'm trying to get at here. The old embracing the new. In other words, it doesn't have to be a necessary schism. It can be where the one embraces the new. You take, for example, televangelism. That is a good example of the Piscean Age religion taking the elements of, of technology and using it. You see the same thing in the Islamic world, for example, where they're using um, modern technology and Skyping and, and Twitter and all these sorts of things to communicate religious uh, methods and ideas. Another dynamic, the fourth dynamic, would be the new order embracing the old. And I like to look at the movie Schindler's List, which is about a businessman, uh, a very secular entrepreneur, who more or less uses Piscean compassion to save a bunch of Jews that were destined for, the, uh, for death in the concentration camps. So you can have many different dynamics there in terms of how these two different ages interact. It doesn't have to be a conflict. 
But let me say a little bit more here about the, the Aquarian Age, because the Aquarian Age is also a, a, a sign, an archetype having to do with groups. Now, so does the Piscean Age. These are the last two signs of the Zodiac, and they have a lot to do with collectives, with groups. But there's an important difference between the two in, in terms of how they express themselves. For instance, uh, there's a line in Corinthians which expresses the old Piscean worldview. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Now compare that, let's say, to the, is it the preamble to the Constitution which says, are we the people? Or, for example, in the 80s, there, all these musicians got together to do this charitable thing called We Are the World. You know, there is a collective, or Facebook is a good example. You don't have much more of a succinct symbol of the Aquarian Age than Facebook, for better and worse. And so think of how those things differ from that idea that we're all cells in the body of Christ. You know, there's a, there's a fundamental difference there that that Christian idea has more to do with, you know, you're giving up your identity in a certain way, you're joining up with the larger whole. And... Uh, there's an image in the Buddhist literature in one of the sutras that's called Indra's Web, which has had a bit of a resurgence the last few years because of holography, this idea that you break up a holographic image into little pieces and each piece contains the entire image. Well, that's a very ancient idea that goes back into the old scriptures. And so let me read you this passage. Alan Watts put it very beautifully when he was describing uh, Indra's Web. Imagine a multidimensional spider's web in the early morning covered with dewdrops. And every dewdrop contains the reflection of all the other dewdrops. And each reflected dewdrop, the reflections of all the other dewdrops in that reflection. And so on ad infinitum. That is the Buddhist conception of the universe in one image. Uh, it's a very profound idea, and it's more than just a faceless sort of collective. There's a real profound sense in which each point, each node in that web has its own unique perspective on the entire web. Some people say, I, I can't vouch for this, that if you, if you break up that holographic image into individual parts, each part contains the entire image, but from a different perspective. I don't know if that's true, but that certainly conveys the idea that you get in the Indra's Web idea. And this ties in to, actually, I'm going to go one step further here, as long as I'm on that particular topic. So let's say this is a collective, and you know, every point of the system, because Aquarius rules networks. Even TV networks, networks, the idea of systems theory, all sorts of different collectives, whether they be human or artistic or technological or religious. And in Indra's web, like I said before, every point, every node in that web contains the entire web. It has its own uniqueness versus, let's say, you can have a system where there's no individuality at all, like that, where... There's no nodes, you might say. There's no individual points. And that ties into the polarity that we have with Aquarius, which is Aquarius Leo. I spoke about Virgo Pisces as being the last 2,000 years, which has so much to do with service, self-denial, an internalized reflective conscience, a sense of, of emotionality. The Aquarius Leo axis, this is groups, but when you throw in a, a Leo there, this has to do with creativity, with spirituality, with, with a sense of selfhood. In other words, if you flip that around, let's do it the other way. Put Leo there and Aquarius there. This is the king or queen on the throne, and that's the populace. Aquarius is the masses. We're moving into an age when the masses are at the top, you might say. It's ruled from the top down. It's like you invert the pyramid so that the masses run the show, so to speak. It's people power. Or it might be corporate power. We're going to find out about that. But a critical way to express this difference is think of the difference between 
a Gregorian chanting choir and a jazz band. What is the difference between the two? Does anybody care to jump in here? What distinguishes a jazz band? Right. There's more autonomy in the jazz band. There is no autonomy in the Gregorian choir. You are pooling, everybody in the Gregorian choir is pooling their creativity and their individuality towards an ideal that's larger than any one person. And in fact, the more you kind of bury yourself in the choir, the better it is as far as the, the ideal of the Gregorian uh, music. Whereas in a jazz band, you're allowed, it's a group dynamic like their Gregorian choir, but it's, you're allowed to have your creativity, you're allowed to express yourself, and you're allowed to improvise. You don't improvise in a Gregorian choir. And that becomes, the jazz band becomes a, a to me, the skeleton key to the Aquarian age, and it becomes a skeleton key to what we're dealing with in mythologies on all sorts of different levels. So for example, take economics. Capitalism is the jazz model applied to money. In other words, in the capitalistic system, ideally, every person has the right, the opportunity to become an entrepreneur and to forge their own destinies economically. As opposed to, let's say, during the age of fiefdoms where a person was under the thumb of the king or the lord of the, the manor, that sort of thing. You did not have the freedom to do what you wanted to do financially. So capitalism, which really, modern capitalism, it's been around as an, ideal for, as an idea for a long time, but you, you look back and Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations was a very important turning point, which was around the discovery of, of, it was either 1781 or 1776, interestingly, that that came out. So economics expresses the jazz idea. In creativity, we see the jazz idea, not just in music with jazz, well, we see it also with the Beatles. The Beatles are an interesting phenomenon as an archetype of the Aquarian age because it, they're not faceless individuals. They started out with like business suits, you know, the same sort of outfit and the same kind of haircuts. Then they branched off very rapidly into being four very distinct individuals, each one of which was creative in their own way. Uh, you see now in society all kinds of individuals becoming creative. You know, there's, I saw a workshop not long ago, how to tap into your inner Leonardo da Vinci, something like that. You're seeing the democratization of creativity. It's not just the artist that goes off in the loft in Paris. Everybody now is trying to become creative. You see this with Instagram. You see this with Facebook. Everybody's becoming, trying to become creative and also very narcissistic in the process. That's, uh, that's, the, that's both the good and the bad of the Aquarius-Leo axis. There's that sense of, of creativity and personal empowerment, but it, it, it can easily go off. That Superman idea that Nietzsche talked about, and then the Nazis perverted that, and it became this idea of the Aryan uh, ideal. Um, that's what happens when Aquarius and Leo get a little bit out of hand. Self-publishing is a big thing now. This idea that anybody can publish their book, anybody can write a blog. That's extremely Aquarius Leo in terms of what that's doing. In politics, the jazz ideal is called democracy. In other words, in a non-democratic society, you don't really have any say over what the leader does. It's ruled from the top down, whether it's a priest or a king or whoever a warlord. In the Aquarian age, the jazz ideal is manifesting as democracy. When you look at how many countries in the last 50 years have become de democratic, it's astonishing. You know, in 1950, there were very few countries that had any democratic rule. Now you have them all over the place. It's not always, you know, honest democracies, but the idea is seeping into the, into the culture. But democracy is the jazz idea in the sense that everybody has a say in the process, ideally. Everybody can contribute. Everybody can play their instrument in the, in the uh, chorus, shall we say. And in a way, you could say that, um, well, I'll get to America in a second there, but, um, well, this is actually a good spot to bring it up. The United States is the embodiment of a lot of these trends. The United States came about at the intersection of three historical streams. 
uh, modern democracy, capitalism, modern capitalism, and the technological industrial revolution. And it embodied this Aquarian mythos, this, this idea of freedom, of creativity, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You do not see that, as far as I know, in any constitution or bill of rights anywhere in the world prior to that. This idea of we have a right to be happy. We take that for granted, and that was a radical idea when they came up with that. And of course, the, the, um, uh, the, the music that America gave to the world is jazz. Well, jazz and blues, but they're very similar in that respect. And so America is the cutting edge of the Aquarian age. America really was born with the discovery of Uranus which rules Aquarius. And America embodies that ideal of freedom, of that sense of that Horatio Alger sort of can-do spirit. You know, there's the flexibility between classes. Prior to America, you still to this day, and maybe there are some people that were raised in England here, but you still to this day hear from people that talk about the class system is still very rigid in parts of Europe and England. And they come here to America, and there's that uh, mobility that they did not have over there. And that is, that's, that's something that America has given the world to some extent. It's not as true anymore. There was a study that came out not long ago that showed mobility is way down in America compared to other countries like Sweden and all that. But uh, America also brought in a certain spirit of narcissism, a certain sense of me. You know, you look at America on the world stage and how it's, that sense of that myopic sort of sense of you know, not being aware of anything that's outside of the boundaries of the United States. So America embodies the good, it Amer embodies the bad, I think, of the Aquarian age. But the bottom line, I think, is that sense of personal empowerment, that sense that to this day people try to get to America from other countries. There's still that sense of seeing America as the beacon, you know, that sense of possibility of the future. You know, that it may not realize itself in reality when they get here, but it's, uh, it's certainly the symbol of that ideal, America is. And this jazz ideal also applies on the level of spirituality and religion. The idea that um, the idea that you can tap into your own personal godhood. Yes, that was always there in the religious traditions of the world. But now it's becoming so common that you can turn on, let's say, or at least I could have when she was on, you could turn on Oprah Winfrey and you could hear them talking about the God within, the, the personal God. That is not something they would have said a thousand years ago in Europe without being burned at the stake. You know, it's this idea of it's inside. It's a democratization of divinity. It's the jazz ideal in the sense of you know, we each are our own gods in a certain respect. It's, um, we're not the children of God so much as the co-creators. It's a very different mythology that's emerging, and it's very similar to this. In other words, the old school approach to religion is more so the hierarchical mode, you know, with God up here and, you know, us poor humans down there. Now it's becoming more of the kind of the horizontal sort of mode of the, the jazz model. Yeah, there may be a, there may be, even if you believe there's a Louis Armstrong leading the band, uh, he was a Leo, by the way, uh, you, you have this sense of you're a participant in the process. You're not, you're not taking orders, so to speak. You're not subservient. You're a, a co-creator. And the Aquarian Age is not the loss of religion. Some people think, and I've read this in a few different books, some people think that the Aquarian age is the age of science, which is true, it is the age of science and technology, but that doesn't mean you cast aside the lessons of the previous ages. It doesn't mean you get rid of religion. The Aquarian age is more about the freedom of religion. It's more about being able to choose. In the old days, you, you went to the church that your parents uh, were... Uh, they went to. You, you went with the mythology that was given to you at birth. Nowadays, you can be born a Christian and become a Jew or a, a Muslim or a, um, a Hindu, whatever it is. That's relatively new. 
Uh, you, there are pockets of that in history, but it's now something that is very common. And to a certain extent, the Theosophical Society is an embodiment of this jazz ideal in the sense of you don't have to subscribe to a certain religion to come here. You can be a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Native American, anything, and still be a member of the Theosophical Society. It's quite similar with Unitarians. It's somewhat similar with the Baha'i, as I recall. So it's not exclusive to the Theosophical Society, but it's this ideal of the jazz model of individuals coming in and partaking of, of, a, of a certain shared framework, you know, like the jazz musicians will be working with a certain piece of uh, a musical score. They're not working, they're not flying with, they're not, how do they say it, flying without a net, I'm not sure. There's some kind of structure there that they're working with. But it's a broad structure, like the three objects in the Theosophical Society. And John Algio used to talk about the Wizard of Oz, and I think that is one of the emblematic mythologies of the Aquarian Age. And he was very insightful the way he pointed out the fact that uh, he first of all found out that uh, Frank Baum had been a member of the Theosophical Society. He joined in 1892. He wrote about Blavatsky's writings for the Kansas City Star. So he was, he was steeped in esoteric literature. And he writes this story that's come down to us where uh, when Dorothy gets to the end of her journey, she doesn't say, I've found Jesus, I've found Buddha. She says it's, she discovers it's inside of her. That's a very Aquarian sort of idea. It's that Aquarius-Leo axis. And um, there's another aspect to the Wizard of Oz, I think, which John didn't touch on. And that is that it's the group dynamic in the Wizard of Oz that is so interesting. Because <laughs> Joseph Campbell used to talk about the fact that he liked to talk about the Arthurian legends, and there was one particular variant of the Arthurian uh, stories, a French variant, I don't know, I don't remember how it's pronounced. But in the story, when the knights go off, off looking for the grail, they go off into the wood by themselves, each one by themselves. Unlike, let's say, Jason and the Argonauts, or those old style myths where they go off together in the Arthurian legends, in this one variant, the knights go off individually. And, and Joseph Campbell saw that as very symbolic of the Western mindset, the individuality. But the Wizard of Oz takes it one step farther because those four creatures, the, the scarecrow, the tin man, the lion, and Dorothy, they're each looking for something totally different. They're, it's, it's really an uncanny sort of uh, symbol because I can't think of another mythology where people go off on a, on a search, a mythic quest, where they're all going for something totally different. That's, and yet they're joined together. They're somehow managing to remain a unit, a community. It's identical in a political sense to the United States and democracy where you have all these different states, that tension between the group and the individual, that's Aquarius. People sometimes say as Aquarius... The group or is it the individual? It's both. It's the tension between the two. And there's always that tension. You see that in the United States between the states and the federal government. You know, that all the stars on that flag represent the individuals. And each one might have a different sort of, like the jazz model, each one might have a certain goal. But they've got to remain within the Constitution. They've got to remain within that basic sheet music. And likewise with Dorothy and her companions... They're all on a quest, but they're all looking for something fundamentally personal and different, which is really, I think, fascinating. Now, so that, that touches on another point here, which is that do the myths simply recycle through the ages? Are they the same at all times? And that's one of the ideas that you hear from disciples of, of, of Joseph Campbell. And the idea really is that well, there was a, a German ethnographer named Adolf Bastian. He was the first one that made the distinction between ele uh, elementary ideas and uh, local ideas, if I remember that correctly. And elementary ideas are those universal principles and themes in mythology that you see around the world, 
Like if you look at, for example, Hamlet, you see it's the same basic story as Osiris. You see it's the same, and, and, and uh, Horace and uh, Seth. It's the same basic story as Krishna, the evil uncle. It's the same basic story in Disney's Lion King. But the thing is that as these fundamental ideas circulate through time, they take on local inflection so that the story of Christ on the cross is not exactly the same as Mithra, is not exactly the same as all the other crucified kings. There's subtle differences. And likewise, these stories come down to us, like Superman, for example, which the new movie is going to be coming out shortly. Superman embodies the hero, but notice he doesn't have a divine origin. He comes, he's an alien. It's interesting that one of the fundamental myths of popular culture is about an alien coming to save humanity. Make of that what you will. Uh, but he's, it's a secular myth. It's not a divine origin. It's a man that comes from another planet. He's got superhuman powers, but he's not a divine agency. That's, that's very Aquarian. You see another thing with um, Day the Earth Stood Still. Many years ago, I heard Robert Wise speak on the uh, north side of Chicago. He directed the movie Day the Earth Stood Still. And I asked him if the parallels between his movie and the story of Jesus were intentional. And he said, no, we weren't at all aware of it. But after the movie came out, religious writers started to point it out. You have this guy that comes down, Michael Rennie, if you remember the movie. He comes down, he's crucified, he's raised from the dead, and he goes back up into heaven. It's basically a replay of the story of, of Christ. But there are these differences. Again, he's not a divine figure. He's a secular figure from another planet. Uh, another example is 2001, the classic hero's myth. This man goes off, uh, Dave Bowman in the story, Kubrick's movie. He goes off on this quest. Everybody else dies on the ship. He's left. He goes through the Stargate, which is like going into Kundalini and in terms of these two walls going past. He's reborn. He comes back as a, a star child, you might say. It's, a, it's the Campbell arc, you might say, the hero's arc. But Along the way, like in most heroes' tales, you encounter an obstacle. You encounter a dragon, for example. But in the movie, what does he encounter? The bowman, the astronaut, encounters a computer named Hal. And if you move each of those letters down one step in the alphabet, you get IBM, by the way, which is kind of funny. Um, so he encounters a computer, not a, not a beast, not a creature like a dragon, but a computer a very high-tech, very brainy computer. The, 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 the dragon that we're facing now is different from the dragon that people faced 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Now we're dealing with the challenge of the mind. We're dealing with information. We're dealing with you know, the, the potential problems that the brain has in terms of uh, that's the gatekeeper, so to speak. And, you know, in the movie, to get into that stargate where he has that transcendental experience, he's got a deprogram the computer, he's got to shut it down somewhat, not totally. But that's kind of like what meditation's about in terms of to get into the transcendent state, you've got to turn off the mind and try doing that after being on Facebook all day. You know, it's the mind is racing, 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 racing because of all the data we're getting. That's the thing about the Aquarian age. It's an embarrassment of riches. There's so much data, so much information, which is a great thing. But like anything, it can go to extremes with that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is wrap up a little bit here and talk about what I'm saying by all this. And like I started off saying that with the question, how do you think differently? How do you see yourself in the world differently than someone in Europe a thousand years ago might have seen themselves in the world differently? And there are certain things that come up, for example, and some people suggested these when we started, such as we're more rational, we're more intellectually oriented, we're, there's more critical thinking, I think, in terms of people not simply accepting authority, not simply accepting belief systems. There are still, of course, holdouts that, that believe anything that comes to them, especially on the internet, you know, you can get all kinds of ideas that you can buy into. But as a general rule, people are more rational. Uh, someone pointed out about the global connectedness. We're global citizens now. In the old days, people had a very local, provincial way of looking at the world. And now the mythologies are telling us, and the reality is telling us, that 
we're no longer isolated in a local community unless you're living in a teepee somewhere like Daryl Hannah in, uh, in somewhere out west, I guess it is. Um, we're interconnected in a way that people 100 years ago couldn't have imagined as being possible. You can get online and within a split second you can be communicating with someone in Japan or India. You know, that's extraordinary. Uh, another thing is that sense of personal creativity. The technology and the educational system is making it possible for individuals to think that they too can be artists, whether they really ought to be or not is another thing. Uh, what is the, uh, the, the game in the online gaming system, you know, the sense of in the old days you'd play with some friends, you'd go out on the street and play with friends. Now you have people playing games with people. You know, that's the Aquarius-Leo axis. Aquarius and Leo together involves group pleasures but sometimes global pleasures and pastimes like online gaming with people in Japan and Alaska and, you know, Tierra del Fuego. Now, um, but that sense of personal empowerment, that sense of that I can do things that people generations ago wouldn't have thought possible, whether that's economically, whether that's creatively, whether that's politically, you know, this, uh, this sense of activism, this sense that I can make a difference in the world. Um, you, I mean, it, for better and worse. You look at people that rise up. Some of our presidents have come, like Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton, have come from very lowly places. On the other hand, so did Adolf Hitler. You know, and it, that, that sense of empowerment can go either way. It can give you great saints and leaders and great tyrants at the same time. So it's in and of itself not a necessarily a, a, a good thing, but it has to do with that Aquarius-Leo axis. Everybody is becoming a king now and a queen in a certain sense. There's a line. Did any, how many of you have seen the movie Whale Rider? Okay, if you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's... it's it's a pretty extraordinary film in some ways, and there's an uh, iconic speech in there where this young girl is talking to a group of people. It's, it's an extraordinary scene because of the feeling this little actress gives in this uh, moment. And it, it's set in New Zealand, I think it is, with the Maori tribe, and, and it's about her trying to raise up, and even though women in those days were not considered to be on an equal terms with men, she was trying to rise up and become a, a, a figure in that community. And she gives a speech, and uh, I'm going to quote what she says there, which is extremely uh, interesting from an Aquarian mythological standpoint. In the speech, she says, but we can learn, and if the knowledge is given to everyone, then we have lots of leaders, and then soon everyone will be strong, not just the ones that have been chosen. You know, that's, that's Aquarian mythology. That's the idea, potentially. That, that's the jazz band idea. It's no longer about a top-down leader at the top of the pyramid issuing orders. Everybody can become a leader, even the women, and that's the other thing. We, our roles have changed. There's more flexibility in terms of our ability to rise up out of our class, so to speak, where we were born. Uh, but that's especially true for women in terms of, I was talking to someone today, uh, a woman about some of these ideas, and she was saying that in her lifetime, 50-something lifetime, she said the change she has seen in her lifetime in terms of women's roles and what women can do has been extraordinary. Obviously, it's still not enough, but compared to where it was, let's say, in 1950, it's, it's an unbelievable shift. Another thing that, um, well, this ties in with that idea, the, the notion that there are no fixed roles, that... You know, in the old days, you you did the profession that your father and your grandfather and your great grandfather did, and now there is more of that flexibility. It's getting a little bit crazy, though, in terms of that um, the roles are so unpredictable now that you don't even know whether an education is going to give you a job. You know, ten, twenty years down the road, um, and and of course the, the the bottom line here, there is an element of freedom that it's very easy to take for granted. I was talking to a fellow not long ago that had to serve time, three years in prison for a drug-related charge. Very nice guy, actually, but he got in way over his head with the drug dependency, and he got you know, thrown in prison. Um, and he came out of prison, and he told me a funny story. 
I thought it was funny. He was taking the bus from the prison with a bunch of other people that weren't from prison, he thought, and the bus broke down. And he was heading from one part of the country to another to be with family members. And he said he got off the bus <laughs> and he said he was just ecstatic. He didn't care if the bus broke down. He was ecstatic not to be in prison. And he saw another woman. Everybody else on the bus was grumbling. About, oh, you know, they were all unhappy. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to anyone. And, but there was one other woman about his own age that was on the bus that was also looking very happy. And she came up to him and says, what were you in for? <laughs> great story. Because they both were the only ones that realized how great it was to just be out and free, but everybody else was grumbling about, you know, the fact that the bus had broken down. And it's so easy to take for granted when you're raised in a country like America, that sense of freedom. And that's part of the mythology. We're living that mythology, whether we know it or not, we're embedded in that. Now, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Are there, let's open it up to questions. If anybody has anything they want to throw in or ask, yes. Uh, just um, yes. In interrupting, we are happy to receive questions. Please wait for the microphone so we can record the question as well as the answer. This isn't exactly a question, but uh, I was thinking about jazz, that it really came from the black people yeah. who had been slaves. And I was thinking the white people who came here were the Puritans. Yeah. And if we hadn't had the black people to, to give us jazz, we would have inherited whatever from the Puritans. Yeah. You know, it would be yeah. a whole different That's ball a scary game. thought. Because they were basically <laughs> religious fundamentalists. I mean, the pilgrims that came over. They were not tolerant of other people with different beliefs once they got here. They wanted to get away from the intolerance, but they were not nearly as nice towards other people that didn't share their beliefs. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait one second for the microphone. Looking ahead a little bit, what kind of archetypes can we expect from the Earth signs? I'm not sure if I know what you mean. Uh, we'll be moving into Capricorn soon enough. <laughs> Do you mean 2,000 years from now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I get that question occasionally. I'm not sure what to expect, although I do think, well, like every age, it's got its good and its bad. The bad is it could be like the Aquarian age. They're root chakra signs. That's something I didn't get into here. Um, I might as well just quickly touch on this because it's a key to understanding the ages and the signs. Um, I've talked about this here before that uh, I studied Kriya Yoga with different Kriya Yoga teachers for many years. And they had this system that was given to them by Yogananda of the chakras, and that the chakras relate to the planets and to the signs. And so you've got the root chakra, Muladhara, is Saturn, and the second chakra, Svadhisthana, is Jupiter. The third chakra, the fire chakra, is uh, Manipur, that's Mars. The heart chakra is Anahata, Venus. Throat chakra, fifth element, quicksilver, Mercury. Uh, Vishuddha, I think it's called. And then actually Yogananda talked about two chakras. The third eye is Ajna chakra, that's the sun. And he talked about a chakra in the back of the head, which he called Chandra chakra, which is the moon chakra. And so you have these seven points there, and they relate to the signs. Saturn is Capricorn Aquarius. Second chakra is Sagittarius Pisces. Mars chakra is Aries, uh, Scorpio, Venus chakra is Libra, Taurus, Mercury, Gemini, Virgo. The sun rules Leo by itself. The moon rules uh, Cancer by itself. So the Aquarian age really is moving down into the root chakra, which isn't necessarily bad. The root chakra has to do with making things practical. It's about practical spirituality. It's also about technology. It's about science. And it can be about corporations and about material, material values taking over. And the age of in my opinion, the age of Capricorn is going to hinge on how the age of Aquarius goes in terms of if the age of Aquarius turns out to be a, a, an age of interconnected corporations really in the world instead of you know kings and queens and popes and Dalai Lamas, then I think the age of Capricorn will perpetuate that with business and you know, but there's always going to be good and bad. You know, you, it, it's, it's, it's dangerous to think of the chakras as good versus bad. You know, everyone has its own value. Yogananda was a Capricorn. 
And that doesn't mean he wasn't spiritual, or it doesn't mean he was materialistic. It means that he was trying to bring the teachings down into practical reality, practical manifestation. So it's a little tough to say 2,000 years in advance, but um, I mean, it could be, the Earth ages could be, some people think that the age of Taurus was about incredible monuments like the pyramids, for example, and Stonehenge. Well, actually, that's earlier, but um, I, I'm not sure what to say, but it's so far off that I, I don't know what to say in detail about it. Yes, sorry. Uh, this gentleman yes. has a question. Uh, yes, and um, I wonder what you might have to say about the clashes that we're experiencing through this change from uh, not only Piscean to Aquarian, but generational changes. Uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, including me, have great difficulty um, connecting and understanding, working with the so-called me generation. Yeah. And uh, we have kids that are, or grandchildren that are part of a generation that uh, we have a hard time understanding what they're really up to, and they don't yeah. want to tell us what it is that they're up to either. So the uh, Time Magazine, you know, recent issue of Time, yeah. an interesting uh, uh, article study of the me generation, I was intrigued with the idea that the me generation the spokespeople for that weren't interested in transitioning from previous values and uh, ideas and structure and so on of previous generation. Um, what they said that I found was amazing was that uh, they, they're not doing that, they're creating their own culture. They have a culture, a, a set of a structure, set of beliefs, uh, everything strictly of their own. This makes it very difficult, for example, for people in the workplace that may be in their uh, 40s and 50s to relate to uh, people who may be their bosses who are part of that generation. And they simply, it, it's very difficult to work with that. Um, what's the future for us? <laughs> in, well, you know, yeah. uh, I, a couple of things I'll say about that. One is the changes are happening more and more rapidly. Be, they're being accelerated by technology and by intercultural sort of, you know, it, it's, I was talking to someone today about the fact that, you know, we want the Middle East, for example, to grow up as fast into a democratic kind of secular culture as fast as we did. You know, and, and it's, it's not necessarily realistic to think that every other culture in the world is going to change as rapidly as we did. And we didn't even change that rapidly when you consider some of the rigidity that's still going on in the culture about certain values. But I remember my dad talking about, my dad uh, was born uh, in 1904. 19, yeah, 1904, and he talked about, you know, he, he ran away from the farm up in Door County and came to Chicago and lived it up during the Roaring Twenties and had a heck of a time from everything I can gather, what he'll, he would have told me. And he described to me how his generation was so different from his parents' generation back in the Roaring Twenties that it was this massive chasm. So it's not entirely new that generational divide, that's happened before, and I think it is happening faster and more drastically now, but I don't think it's entirely new. And, um, or you look, at the, <laughs> you look at the Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean and that sense of, you know, the, the, the difficulty that people were having trying to relate to each other across the generational divide. So I'm not sure it's as serious a problem as it appears on the surface, because I think it's, you, know, you read, what is it, Socrates or Plato, and they talk about the lack of respect for the elders or whatever, it's, you know, that's, that's not entirely new. And part of the reason that I think, I might be wrong, it's been years since I read this, part of the reason that they wanted uh, Socrates to drink the hemlock was because they felt he was polluting the minds of the young people. You know, so that's, you know, what, what's, what's, uh, what's the old saying? Things aren't like they used to be and they never were. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's possible. Any other questions? Uh, we have a question from someone online. How can we prepare to be better jazz artists of our lives? What role might intuition or synchronicity play? Okay, good question. That actually ties into something I, was, I, I wanted to cover here, which is how do you make the most out of what's happening in terms of the age and the mythology that we're 
in and, and facing. And one of the things about an age, it's like a horoscope. I've often described a horoscope as being like a musical score, like sheet music. If you give a, 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 a sheet music to Claire de Lune or Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata to uh, the pianist Horowitz, if he was still alive, he'd play it beautifully. But if you gave it to your Aunt Martha, who never really learned how to play, it would come out very differently. Same thing with a horoscope. Two different individuals can have a, a, basically the same horoscope and yet manifest it very differently. You'll sometimes see, like the example I've, I've used is Chaplin and Hitler were born basically at the same time, four days apart. They look identical. And one became the greatest you know, comedian in history practically and the other became the greatest tyrant in history. And they were working with some very similar energies in their chart, you know, a very intense Saturn, Mars, Venus in their chart, and amongst other things. And the same thing applies to an age. With any given great age, you have what, what I think it was Ken Wilber talked about, the growing tip of an era. You have those individuals that represent the highest potentials of that age, and you have those individuals that are not so high potentials, like St. Francis of Assisi was the higher potential of the Piscean age, whereas Torquemada or Jerry Falwell maybe not so high a manifestation of the Piscean age. And likewise, with the Aquarian Age, there's different ways we can tap into this energy and utilize it in a constructive way. Um, I, we've looked at the creative individuals like the Beatles or Bob Dylan or uh, Steve Jobs, the individuals that rise up and tap into their creativity and manifest it uh, through one form or another. You have it in terms of this ability now to self-publish, this ability to to take your ideas and put them out there. You don't have to necessarily go through the old rigid hierarchical structures. I think that Oprah Winfrey, whatever you think of her, is an embodiment. She's an Aquarius, by the way. And she's an embodiment of the potential of someone that can rise up from very lowly conditions and very bad conditions, actually, into a, a position of enormous influence and use the media I mean, you don't have much more of an Aquarian figure than Oprah Winfrey in some respects in terms of that ability to empower people. Her whole message is empowerment. She's got a very strong Aquarius Leo axis in her chart. Um, that sense of trying to get people to do, to, to, do, to lift themselves up, you might say. Uh, you have businessmen, you have CEOs, you have entrepreneurs that are using their wealth for the betterment of their society. That's a very Aquarian sort of uh, process, that idea of uh, taking very Aquarian, very practical sorts of resources and using it to help the world. I have, well, I'm not going to get into specific names here with that, but let's take the fictional, uh, well, the depiction is fictional, of of uh, Schindler, Oscar Schindler in the movie Schindler's List, a man who was an entrepreneur that took his abilities to save people. So it's not as though the Aquarian Age is necessarily bad in certain ways with business or with th that me generation thing. All of these things that can go in a wrong direction with the Aquarian Age, they can be used in good ways. They can be developed, you know, the, uh, getting back to your question there, how do you develop those skills? How do you really tap into the highest potentials? And one of the things that most mystics will tell you is that the, there has to be some sort of contemplative exercise, some sort of meditation. Uh, it could even be prayer for that matter, because one of the real challenges of the Aquarian age that we're already seeing is distraction of there are so many things, there's so many shiny baubles to attract our attention that it's very easy to get thrown off center and get caught up in superficialities and that's why it's, it's I think, critical to take some time every day or every week at the very least to go, to go inside to kind of shut out the world. You know, that old uh, Jewish Sabbath idea of you take a day to do nothing and not be engaged in the world, there's a, there's a, sp a spiritual reason for that. Um, and one other thing I want to, I don't want to forget the activist potential. In the old days, people felt very disempowered, very powerless. Uh, when something was going wrong in the society and the world, it was very rare for someone like a Cesar Chavez or a Martin Luther King 
to kind of risk their life to go out there and, and try to change the world or Mahatma Gandhi. Nowadays, anybody can become an activist. That's one of the nice things about the, the internet, that like the Occupy movement, which didn't go as far as many of us wanted, but it showed the power of technology to rally individuals together and to make changes. And nowadays, you can still make those changes. If you see a, a problem, you can contact your local politician. You can rally people together to sign petitions, to march on Washington, that sort of thing. You can blog about it on your website. There's all sorts of things you can do that weren't available to people a long time ago, at least not nearly as easily. Now, I don't know if I'm answering the question well, the person is not here, so oh, we'll take that it. Makes that makes it simple. Uh, it's it's <laughs> been it answered. <laughs> Any other questions? Did I see a hand going up over here? Did you? Yeah. I just wonder if we're going to have a world to live in. That, that you know, disturbs me. And now with everyone going for themselves, and, and yeah, I'm an activist. Um, environmental so this occurs to me what's going to happen I that? didn't even go there because it's such a vast and complicated subject I said to someone today that the environmental question is the 800 pound gorilla in the room as far as the Aquarian age goes uh, my friend John David Ebert wrote a book called the age of catastrophe uh, he used to write for us at the quest and he's turned into a, a, a very brilliant author and um, he talks about he lays out the stats which shows it's pr quite scary in terms of it looks pretty irreversible in some ways, you know, so unless the aliens come down and change things, it's, we're, we're in for some rough times, or at least people, in, you know, in certain areas are particularly in danger. And the Aquarian Age, you know, I think it will be the leading challenge, to be very honest, I think it's the leading challenge of the Aquarian Age. You know, the sign Aquarius is in a square to Taurus. You know, it's in a 90 degree angle, which is what some people interpret to mean that that could mean it's a lot of, there's a lot of earth changes, there's a lot of very difficult things, and it's going to require massive efforts to kind of, I don't think we can turn it back, but I think we can stem it to some extent. And there are things in, in mythology, in, in Aquarian mythology, you might say, that touch on that in terms of the constellation of Aquarius having to do with flooding in some of the ancient myths. So I do think, you know, the sea levels rising and, and pollution and all that, I think that's all real serious. Hopefully we might develop technology to turn that around. That's, I think that's the one big hope, that um, there are technologies we don't now have or understand that could make a difference down the road. But it, it's, the big, it's the, big, uh, the big danger of the Aquarian Age. Were you going to add something to that? Yeah, well, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, it's going to motivate people when it hits them personally and not probably a minute sooner. <laughs>